Today's lecture will be devoted to British politics. The history of British politics over the past 800 years has been largely one of breaking down the monarch's former power and vesting that authority in Parliament as the sovereign legal voice of the people. This struggle has produced bitter conflicts on governmental, social and religious level, as well as slowly evolving political institutions. The original structures were monarchical, aristocratic and non-democratic. These have been gradually adapted to the requirements of parliamentary democracy, changing social conditions and the mass franchise of today. So, Lecture 8. British Political Institutions We shall speak about political history, constitutional framework, and also we shall learn the main functions of the monarchy, the Privy Council, and Parliament. Between 1066 and 1199, English monarchs had great power, but generally accepted advice and some limitations on their authority. However, later kings such as King John often ignored these restrictions, and the French Norman barons united against his rule. They forced him to sign Magna Carta in 1215. Although this document was initially intended to protect the aristocracy and not the ordinary citizen, it came in time to be regarded as a cornerstone of British liberties and is one of the oldest written constitutional papers. Among other things, it restricted the monarch's powers, forced him to take advice, promoted an aristocratic influence in national affairs, these developments encouraged the establishment of basic parliamentary structures against royal power. In 1265, Simon de Montfort called England's first parliament, which was composed of nobles and minor aristocrats. This was followed in 1295 by the model parliament, which was to serve as an example for future structures. It took sections consisted of the lords of and bishops, who were chosen by the monarch, and the commons, which comprised elected male representatives. These two units gradually moved further apart over time, and eventually evolved into the present parliamentary division between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. However, in the 13th century, the combined parliament of aristocrats and commoners was too large to rule the country effectively. A Privy Council was created, which was an expansion of the traditional small circle of advisors as the royal court. It refused royal requests for money. It eventually forced Charles I to sign the Petition of Heights in 1628, which further restricted the monarch's powers and was intended to prevent him from raising taxes without Parliament's consent. Charles tried to ignore these political developments. Realizing that he could not control Parliament, Charles next failed in his attempt to arrest parliamentary leaders in the House of Commons itself. Because of this episode, the monarch was in future prohibited from entering the Commons. The 1688 changes considerably affected the British constitution and politics. William III became British first constitutional monarch, and because of conditions imposed, imposed upon him, it was in future practically impossible for the monarch to reign without the consent of parliament. A series of acts at this time laid the foundation for later political and constitutional developments. The Declaration of Rights in 1689 tried to establish basic civil liberties and prevented the monarch from making laws or raising an army without parliament's approval. The Act of Settlement in 1701 gave religious freedom to all Protestants and stipulated that all future English monarchs had to be Protestant. Parliamentary power continued to grow gradually in the early 18th century, initially because the German-born George I lacked interest in English affairs of state. He also mistrusted the Tories with their Catholic sympathies and appointed weak ministers such as Robert Walpole to his Privy Council. Eventually, Walpole became chief minister leader of the Whig party and the head of the Whig majority in the House of Commons, which was now mainly composed of wealthy land and property owners. Walpole's resulting control of political power enabled him 
to increase parliamentary influence, and he has been called Britain's first prime minister. But such parliamentary authority was by no means absolute, and later monarchs sought a return to royal dominance. However, George III eventually lost much of his own and royal authority after the loss of the American colonies with their revolution against Britain in 1775. He was obliged to appoint William Pitt as his Tory chief minister, and it was under Pitt that the office of prime minister really developed. The Whigs and the Tories were political fractions and then political parties in the parliaments of England, Scotland, Great Britain, Ireland and the United Kingdom. Between the 1680s and the 1850s, two parties contested power with each other. The Whigs merged into the new Liberal Party in the 1850s. Under the leadership of Robert Peel, the Tories began to transform into the Conservative Party. The governmental model that operates in Britain today is usually described as a constitutional monarchy or parliamentary system. While the monarch still has a role to play on some executive and legislative levels, it is parliament which possesses the essential legislative power, and the government of the day which governs the initiating and controlling political policy and legislation. The correct constitutional definition of parliament is the Queen in Parliament, and all state and governmental business is carried out in the name of the monarch by the politicians and officials of the system. The various branches of the political system, although easily distinguishable from each other, are not entirely separate. The monarch is formally head of the executive, the legislature and the judiciary. A member of Parliament MP in the House of Commons and a member of the House of Lords may both be in the government of the day. A law lord in the House of Lords also serves the House of Lords at the highest appeal court. The legislature, which consists of both Houses of Parliament and formerly the monarch, is for most purposes a supreme law-making body. The executive comprises the sitting government and its cabinet, together with government ministers or departments headed by ministers or secretaries of state, who all act formally in the name of the monarch. The judiciary is composed mainly of the judges of the higher courts, who determine the common law and interpret acts of parliament. Judiciary is supposed to be independent of the legislative and executive branches of the government. The British monarch, currently Elizabeth II, is the head of the state and the sovereign, but not the head of government. The monarch takes little direct part in governing the country and remains neutral in political affairs. However, the authority of the state that is vested in the sovereign, known as the crown, remains as the source of executive power exercised by the government. The monarch has a number of roles and serves formally as head of state, head of executive, judiciary and legislature branches, a commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and the supreme governor of the Church of England. The monarch still performs some important executive and legislative duties, which are essential to the smooth running of government. These include the summoning, opening and dissolving of parliament, giving the royal assent or signature to bills which have been passed by both Houses of Parliament, appointing government ministers and other public figures, granting honours, holding audiences with the Prime Minister, convening meetings of the Privy Council, giving pardons to some convicted criminals and fulfilling international duties as head of state. In practice, most of these functions are performed by the monarch on the advice of the Prime Minister or other ministers. The Privy Council developed from a small group of royal advisers at court into the chief source of executive authority. But its powerful position was weakened in the 18th and 19th centuries, as more of its functions were transferred to a developing parliamentary cabinet. Its work was later developed 
to newly created ministries which were needed to cope with a rapidly changing society. Today its main role is to advise the monarch on a range of matters like uh, the resolution of constitutional issues and the approval of orders in council, such as the granting of royal charters to public bodies. Its members can be appointed to advisory and problem-solving committees and because of its international membership and continuing constitutional character, it can be influential. There are about 380 Privy Councillors at present, but the organization tends to work for practical purposes mostly through small groups. A full council is usually only summoned on the death of a monarch, when there are serious constitutional issues at stake, or occasionally when a Commonwealth Heads of State conference is held in London. Apart from its practical duties and its role as a constitutional forum for experienced people, perhaps the most important task of the Privy Council today is performed by its Judicial Committee. This serves as the final court of appeal from those dependencies and Commonwealth countries which have retained this avenue of appeal. It may also be used as an arbiter for a wide range of courts and committees in Britain and overseas, and its rulings can be influential. Parliament is a supreme legislative authority in Britain, and since it's not controlled by a written constitution, it has legal sovereignty in virtually all matters, subject only to some European community decisions. This means that it can create, abolish or amend laws for all or any parts of Britain on any topic. The main functions of Parliament today are to pass laws, to vote on financial bills so that government can carry on its legitimate business, to examine government policies and administration, and to scrutinize European community legislation. Parliament consists of the House of Lords, the House of Commons, and formerly the Monarch. It assembles as a unified body only on ceremonial occasions, such as the state opening of Parliament by the Monarch in the House of Lords. Here it listens to the Monarch's speech from the throne, which outlines the government's broad legislative program for the coming session. All three parts of Parliament must normally pass a bill before it can become an act of parliament and therefore law. A correctly created act cannot be challenged in the law courts on its merits. A parliament has a maximum duration of five years, but it is often dissolved and a general election called before the end of this term. Westminster Palace is the seat of the British Parliament. Westminster Palace was built by Edward the Confessor in about 1050 and was used as a royal residence, then as a seat of government and finally, after 1547, as a meeting place for Parliament. The contemporary House of Lords consists of the Lords Temporal and the Lords Spiritual. The Lords Spiritual are the Archbishops of York and Canterbury together with 24 senior bishops of the Church of England. The Lord's Temporal consists of hereditary peers who have kept their titles, life peers who have usually been created by political parties, and the Lords of Appeal, known as Law Lords, who became life peers on their judicial appointments. The latter served the House of Lords as the ultimate court of appeal for most purposes from most parts of Britain. This appeal court doesn't consist of the whole House of Lords, but only some nine law lords who have held senior judicial office, who are under the chairmanship of the Lord Chancellor, and who form a quorum of three to five when they hear appeal cases. There are some 1,200 members of the House of Lords but the active daily attendance varies from a handful to a few hundred. Peers receive no salary for their parliamentary work, but are eligible for attendance and travelling expenses should they wish to claim them. 
The House is presided over by the Lord Chancellor. The House of Commons consists of members of Parliament, MPs, who are elected by the adult suffrage of the British people and who are said to represent the citizen in Parliament. In practice, this means that a government can be elected with a minority of the popular vote and is able to carry out its policies because it has achieved a majority of the seats in the House of Commons. The Commons has 650 MPs, of whom under 10% are women. There are 523 parliamentary seats for England, 38 for Wales, 72 for Scotland and 17 for Northern Ireland. The Speaker presides over meetings of the House of Commons. Let's sum up the main points of Lecture 8. Parliament consists of two chambers or two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The more important and powerful of these is the House of Commons, whose members are elected by the public. The Prime Minister and most of the government are members of the House of Commons. The House of Lords is made up of lords who have inherited their titles and the right to sit in the House, and the life peers who were appointed by the Queen on the advice of the government of the day. Half of the building of Westminster Palace is used by the Commons and the other half by the Lords. At the Westminster Bridge End is the residence of the Speaker who presides over meetings of the House of Commons, and at the other end is the residence of the Lord Chancellor who presides over the House of Lords. Parliament's most important function is the making of laws. Before a new law can come into effect, it must pass through three stages in each house and be given the Queen's approval. It then becomes an act of Parliament. So, there are some comprehension questions for you to discuss and be ready to answer in written form. Thank you for your interest in country study and in the history of the United Kingdom. Stay tuned to our YouTube channel.